I managed to end up in resting just that day. Uh -huh. You know those big cement mixers? That never ever pass here. Yeah. Pass <laughs> Oh no, don't oh, yeah. say that, you'll curse yes. us. <laughs> anyway. Oh, oh, all right then. Yeah. You happy? Yeah. Okay then. I, I want to start off just how I'm starting with everybody. If yeah. you give me your name, your date of birth, mm. and when you came to Britain. Yeah. My name is Connie Mark, and I came to the United Kingdom in November 1954. And I was born on the 21st of December, 1923, which makes me 74 and a Sagittarian. What's your earliest memory of the West Indies? My earliest memories? Oh, that's easy. The thing is, I was very lucky in that I grew up in a very happy family atmosphere. And although I was just like my sister and I, but we always have a lot of family around. And the church, played a very great important part in our lives and we all went to church and Sunday school and all the things that the events that the churches have and I sort of remember all the while going swimming before I went to school things like that and um, meeting my friends and then I played the piano so I always have go to my friends and we used to have all the piano recitals and things like that so I had a very happy childhood in the West in Jamaica What's your earliest memory of Britain? Ah, cold, sullen faces. All the houses looked alike. I thought if I went out of my house and come, I couldn't find it. So I used to leave a little brick, a brick outside <laughs> or something. And I know, well, that's the house I'm supposed to enter, you know. But the earliest thing about me is that the accommodation. You know, when you're in the West Indies, I'm from, I'm from Kingston, which is a city and you're accustomed to have a big house with many bedrooms and a patio or what we call a veranda front and a veranda at the back, um, garden at the front and garden at the back, maids quarters and quarters for the gardener and then you come here and find you're stuck in one room with a husband and a baby. That was the biggest shock for me because nobody told me, nobody warned me. Nobody told you, nobody warned you. Why did you come over then? Oh, let me hold on. I'm going to get more sunny tape. Let's get that down. Shall I get some tape? Uh, I might be alright with this. Mm -hmm. Oh dear. You know. Yeah. Silly, mm -hmm. isn't it? I think that's all. I've always been yeah. stunned by that. The amount of Jamaicans that tell me they can't swim. Why? <laughs> I don't get it. Okay. Like yeah. So. That's good. All right. What then. did we um, get to? Yes, you said nobody told you. No, because you see, the thing is, my first husband, Stanley Goodridge, was a prof came over to play professional cricketer because he was a fast bowler, and he used to represent Jamaica in the in the islands. And this Englishman came and saw what a very good fast bowler he was, and got a contract for him okay. in Siam Harbour in Durham. So. He came over to this country, and of course, while he was there, his daughter was born. And I'm not saying he didn't want to see me, but he wanted to see his daughter. So we came over by air, and I brought my daughter here when she was three months old. What about? And, uh, I just have to do Sorry. the to change that. So oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so a little that's cloud fine. has come over. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, so nothing to do with work reasons that was so oh no family. work no no i didn't think about work i mainly came to spend a year anyway and i worked as a medical secretary i worked i was in the army first of all for 10 years and i worked as a medical secretary in the british army and then i worked at the university college hospital of the west indies so i left my job there to come here and i just bought a suitcase intending to spend a year or two of my husband's contract i'm still there after 42 years 43 years I don't know whether to be pleased about that or not when people say I, st I intended to come for a little while then I stayed. Is that good? Is that good? Well, it's not a matter of good, it just happens. Not a point is good, it just happens that way. You see, the thing is, when you come and then you stay year after year, you've got to think of when I've got to go back and you've got to start all over again. And sometimes it's not, it's more complicated than that. Sometimes the we, the women, want to go back, but the men don't want to go. Why? So, you, what, men? Because men are men, aren't they? Stick in the muds, you know. We're much more adventurous women, I think. <laughs> so, what was 
your working life like over here then? Tell me about that. I enjoyed working here very much because I, I fought and I got the job that I wanted because I came as a secretary and it was very difficult to get a job, a secretarial job in those days. Where well, you want me to look? You are there. No, no, to are me. You? Oh, good, good. Because some people want me to look at the camera. Yeah, no, yes, no. good. Yes. And um, I was determined that I'm going to work as a medical secretary. And people used to laugh at me. You never get a job. They don't. College people don't get office jobs, secretarial jobs. And I had difficulty. I used to go to places and they used to say, just a minute, madam, and in the end, I mean agencies, and I said, you haven't got to go to the other office and say to them, will you accept a colored person? You could tell them on this phone in front of me, I said, because I know that's what you're going to ask about, you know? And um, I had that quite a lot, and I got things like, well, we're not so sure of your educational qualifications, and I said, but... The same examinations that you take in England, we take in the, in the Commonwealth. And I'm in the Commonwealth. I say you took junior Cambridge, senior Cambridge, high schools, matriculation high school, so did we. I said I've got, I passed all those examinations, you know. And, well, of course, when I look back at it, you can't really blame them. For it's all these young white girls who weren't taught anything about the, the Commonwealth in schools anyway. So, I mean, as far as they are concerned, we can't even read English. Well, you say, I mean, I know you're looking back now, and it sounds, you sound very strong, and you sound very fierce, and you sound very definite. Now, I wouldn't feel that if that happened to me now. I wouldn't feel that. I want to know how you No, you felt wouldn't feel that. At the time. No, you wouldn't feel that because you would not have gone 10 years giving your service to the British government, to the British Army, during the war. So having done that, I felt I was entitled to better treatment. And did you say that? Yes, of course I said it. I wasn't afraid to say it. Now I've been really... That's the thing, you sound very unafraid. That is the word. Lots of people have uh, told me things that sound sad. You know? I'm not sad. So I'm not sad because I could fight them. Yeah. Because I eventually got a job as a medical secretary. At the National Hospital for Nervous Diseases, Queen Square. I fought and I won. So why should I be sad? If I didn't win, then I would be sad. Okay, tell me about that. I want to know about... Oh dear. Yeah. Is it going to hold off? Mm. Yeah, no. Mm. Yeah. Ooh. Well, we'll yeah. go, keep going. We'll see how it yeah. goes. If it gets yeah. too bad, yeah. it gets too bad. Yeah. Um, I want to know how you felt about the other nurses. Did you have friends? who were nurses as opposed to secretaries? No, nurses were all right. Nurses found it easier to get jobs because they need nurses more. Nurses were essential services. They need nurses more than they need secretaries. You know, so nurses didn't have any difficulty. So what kind of difficulty did you have in your day-to-day -day at work then? Oh, at work, once I get in there, I was all right. I didn't have any, I, I mean, once I got the job, I was happy because no, I was needed. No problems, no issues for your bosses or whatever? Yeah, yeah. And the people working beside you, how did they treat you? Well, fortunately they were mostly Irish. And we used to see these signs, room for rent, no Irish, no college, no children, no dogs. So the Irish and I were very friendly because they felt that the English was against us. So we are fighting the same war. <laughs> when did you stop feeling like a foreigner? I still feel like a foreigner. Yeah. yeah. I still feel that way. I have a British passport, and so, but I, you're still being, I mean, I, 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 I don't really feel I belong here. I still belong in Jamaica. You've been here 40 odd years. Yeah. Why don't you belong here then? If you don't belong, who does? Why don't you feel you belong? Well, I'm, for one thing, they're going to tell me I wasn't born here, and things like that. I think we'll have to get up now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. Okay, so... Yeah, first, the first question being, when did coloured become black? Well, as far as I know, coloured became black when the Americans decided that they're not going to call themselves uh, Negroes anymore. And then they says, oh, we are going to call ourselves coloureds. And as I always say, using a Jamaican phrase, we are so full of fashion. That as we, everything the Americans do, we, we do it too. 
So we decided, oh, we'll call ourselves Colored. Well I, well, I mean, for years and years, until I was about 40, 40 45, I was Colored. And then all of a sudden, I'm being told, well, we shouldn't call ourselves Colored, you know, we should call us, because the Americans decide to use the terminology black. So we use the terminology black. But deep down in my heart, I don't feel black. I feel colored, because that's what the word I grew up with. I mean, I grew up with the name Constance Winifred, and all of a sudden I'm going to be Marguerite Christine. It's not fair to accept, to expect me to just change overnight to be Marguerite Christine when I grew up as Constance Winifred. You know what I mean? But, and I mean, deep down in my heart, I really don't see why I should be referred to as a colour. A Welshman or a Welshwoman is Welsh, they're Irish, they're Scottish, they're Italians, they're Jewish. Why I must be referred to as a colour? What about black British children today who call themselves black British? Why do you think they have problems with their own identity? Well, the, the old thing about it is that, you see, if you're born in Italy, you have an Italian passport. Or if you're born where you're here, you're born here, you're never English. If you're English, you've got to be white. But if you're born here, you're British. You'll never ever be English. And of course, black kids don't need an identity. Everybody needs an identity if it comes to that. But they need an identity. Because they know as soon as they enter somewhere, nobody's going to stop and think, you know, where you were born. You look at your color. And I always say, why be prejudiced against poor young black British? If they go, if the school system here is so rotten or not so good as it used to be, and they're not as educated, they must blame the system in this country, not their colour. Blame the system in this country. And they sort of forget that there are a lot of black British who have gone on to university and who have degrees and who can demand good jobs. They never get it, but they can demand it because they've got the certificates. But they know, because they haven't got the right colour, as soon as they get in there, the colour can be against them. Okay, two things that came from that. One, you said you can demand the job, but you might not get it. Why shouldn't I get it, number one? And this is related. Number two, how do you see the future for the black British of today? 